The moon is Earth's constant companion. However, there's a lot we don't know about this natural satellite of our planet. However, thanks to recent advances in technology, we're getting more facts about the moon, including the first real photos that suggest people live on the moon. Who lives on the moon, and how were we able to finally find out? Stay tuned as we bring you details of the latest discoveries from the other side of the moon. A little known fact about the moon is that from the Earth we only see one side. Why is this? The answer is fascinating and boils down to a term called tidal locking. Imagine a cosmic dance between the Earth and the Moon where over billions of years they've synchronized their steps in such a perfect way that one side of the Moon always faces us. Interestingly, initially, our Moon didn't always show just one face to Earth. In its younger days, it rotated more rapidly on its axis. However, Earth's gravitational pull exerted forces on the Moon, creating bulges on its surface. As the moon rotated, these bulges tried to align themselves with the Earth, but due to the moon's initial spin, they were always a bit behind. This mismatch created what we call tidal torques, slowing down the moon's rotation bit by bit. Over vast stretches of time, the gravitational tugs and pulls from Earth acted like a break on the moon's spin until it reached a point where its rotation period matched its orbital period. This phenomenon, where an object's rotational period equals its orbital period, is tidal locking. The result of this cosmic dance is that the same side of the moon, the near side, always faces Earth, while the other side, the far side, usually called the dark side, remains hidden from our view. In fact, humans didn't get their first glimpse of the far side until 1959. It was an epic moment in space exploration. In case you are wondering if this means the moon is stuck in this position forever, the story gets even more captivating here. The same forces that caused the moon to become tidally locked with Earth are also causing the moon to slowly drift away from us. Each year, the moon moves about 3.8 centimeters farther from Earth. Over millions of years, this can result in significant changes. While the moon's motion away might alter dynamics in the far future for the foreseeable time, we will continue to see that familiar face of the moon looking down at us. And while we're on the topic, Earth is not immune to these effects either. The same tidal forces from the moon are acting on Earth, gradually slowing our planet's rotation. Eventually, billions of years from now, Earth might become tidally locked to the moon. However, by that time, other significant cosmic events might have already reshaped our solar system. But when did we get our first detailed view of what happens on the dark side of the moon? This is where things get really interesting. The first person to see the dark side of the moon was Michael Collins, the command module pilot of Apollo 11, the first crewed lunar landing mission. Collins was one of the three crew members of Apollo 11, along with Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin, who made history by landing on the moon on July 20th, 1969. However, Collins did not join his colleagues on the lunar surface. Instead, he stayed in lunar orbit, piloting the command module Columbia, while Armstrong and Aldrin descended to the moon in the lunar module Eagle. Collins had a vital role in the mission, as he was responsible for maintaining contact with Earth and ensuring that Columbia was ready to rendezvous and dock with Eagle when it returned from the moon. He also performed scientific experiments and observations from orbit such as taking photographs and measurements of the lunar terrain and environment. However, his most remarkable achievement was being the first human to see the dark side of the moon with his own eyes. As Columbia orbited the moon, Collins experienced periods of radio silence when he passed behind the moon and lost contact with Earth. During these periods, he was alone and isolated from his crewmates and from humanity. He later described this feeling as awareness, anticipation, satisfaction, confidence, almost exultation. He also said that he felt not lonely, but rather very much alone. During these periods of solitude, 
Collins had a unique opportunity to witness something that no one else had ever seen before the dark side of the moon. He described it as a stark and lonely place that was three times as rugged as that side of the moon which we see from Earth. He saw craters, mountains, valleys, and plains that were untouched by human exploration. He also saw stars that were brighter and more numerous than on Earth, as there was no atmosphere or sunlight to obscure them. Collins also saw some features that were unique to the dark side of the moon. He saw the South Pole Aitken Basin, which is the largest and deepest impact crater on the moon. It is about 2,500 kilometers across and 13 kilometers deep. It is so big that it covers almost a quarter of the dark side of the moon. Collins also saw the lunar far side highlands, which are a region of highlands that cover most of the dark side of the moon. They are composed of anorthosite, a type of rock that is rich in calcium and aluminum. Collins also saw some smaller craters that had interesting names, such as Tsiolkovsky, Korolev, and Leibniz. Collins was awestruck by the beauty and mystery of the dark side of the moon. He later wrote, The thing that really surprised me was that it projected an air of fragility, and why I don't know. I don't know to this day. I had a feeling it's tiny, it's shiny, it's beautiful, it's home, and it's fragile. He also said that he felt a connection with the moon as if it were a living being. I really believe that if there are some cosmic bakers out there in space who are cooking up this enormous universe for us to live in, they started with a huge ball of dough and they are still pinching off little pieces here and there. And one day they pinched off a piece which eventually became Earth. And then they pinched off a smaller piece which became our moon. Collins orbited the moon 30 times during his solo flight, spending about 48 minutes on each orbit on the dark side. He took hundreds of photographs and recorded his observations and impressions on a tape recorder. He also made sketches and notes on maps and charts. He later shared his findings and experiences with scientists and the public, contributing to our knowledge and understanding of the moon. There is, however, one allegation that has refused to go away. Not all the details or findings from the dark side of the moon have been publicly shared. For instance, one of the most intriguing and controversial claims about the moon landing is that Neil Armstrong and his crew were not alone on the lunar surface. According to some sources, they were being watched by unidentified flying objects or UFOs that were hovering above them. These sources also claim that Armstrong reported this sighting to NASA via radio, but that the transmission was censored or distorted by the agency. One of these sources is Otto Binder, a writer and former NASA employee. He claimed that he had access to a secret NASA tape that recorded the conversation between Armstrong and Mission Control during the moon landing. He said that he heard Armstrong say, These babies are huge, sir. Enormous. Oh God, you wouldn't believe it. I'm telling you there are other spacecraft out there lined up on the far side of the crater edge. They're on the moon watching us. Another source is Maurice Chatelain, a former NASA communications engineer and chief of NASA communications systems. He claimed that he was in charge of designing and testing the Apollo communication and data processing system. He said that he witnessed Armstrong's radio transmission and confirmed that he saw UFOs on his radar screen. He said, The encounter was common knowledge in NASA, but nobody has talked about it until now. All Apollo and Gemini flights were followed both at a distance and sometimes also quite closely, by space vehicles of extraterrestrial origin, flying saucers or UFOs, if you want to call them by that name. Every time it occurred, the astronauts informed Mission Control, who then ordered absolute silence. Both Binder and Chatelaine claimed that they had evidence to support their allegations, but that they were either destroyed or confiscated by NASA or the U.S. government. They also claimed that they were threatened or harassed by the authorities for revealing the truth. They said that they decided to speak out because they believed that the public had a right to know about the existence of extraterrestrial life and intelligence. However, their claims have been met with skepticism and criticism by many experts and officials. They have been accused of fabricating or misinterpreting the evidence or of being motivated by fame or money. They have also been challenged by other witnesses and participants of the moon landing, who denied seeing or hearing anything unusual or anomalous. For example, Neil Armstrong himself said, 
There was no such communication with Mission Control about UFOs. There were no objects out there other than the four pieces of our own hardware which we discarded. I can deny the story quite unequivocally. The debate over Binders and Chatelaine's claims continues to this day, as some people believe them to be true, and others dismiss them as false or hoax. The question remains, did Neil Armstrong really see UFOs on the moon? And if so, why did NASA hide it from the world? The answer may lie in the secret tapes and documents that are still classified or missing, or in the memories and testimonies of those who were involved in the historic event. Until then, we can only speculate and wonder about what really happened on July 20th, 1969. However, those two men are not the only sources of claims of extraterrestrials inhabiting the dark side of the moon. One such intriguing narrative comes from Donna Hare, a former NASA contractor. Her claim? That she was privy to efforts within the agency to airbrush and modify lunar photos, specifically to remove structures that might resemble buildings or machines. Donna Hare's association with NASA wasn't something minor or fleeting. She worked as a technical illustrator and draftsman for a contractor at the Johnson Space Center in Houston during the early 1970s. With security clearances that allowed her access to various parts of the center, she wasn't just a casual outsider. Her position placed her in close proximity to the photos and images that NASA was analyzing and releasing to the public. The crux of Hare's claim is an incident she recalls, where a colleague, who was working in a photo lab, showed her an aerial photograph of Earth with a distinct shadow cast over the water. The shadow, the colleague suggested, was of a UFO. He then went on to describe how part of his job was to airbrush such anomalies out of photographs before they were released to the public. But that's not all. Another sensational aspect of her story was her mention of lunar photographs. Hare claimed that there were images of the moon that depicted structures resembling both buildings and machines. These were by no means natural formations, she intimated, but potential evidence of extraterrestrial constructs. And, just like the UFO shadows, these structures, according to her, were systematically removed from photographs before public dissemination. One can imagine the impact of such a claim, especially given the backdrop of the 1970s, a time rife with interest in UFOs and space mysteries. If true, Hare's revelations could mean that NASA was or is aware of extraterrestrial life or activity and is actively concealing it. Such a notion would undoubtedly ruffle feathers, both within the scientific community and the public at large. However, skeptics of Hare's claims propose alternative explanations. One of the most prevalent counterarguments is that what might appear as structures on the lunar surface could easily be geological formations, shadows, or photographic anomalies. The moon, after all, has a dynamic landscape, with its craters, hills, and valleys creating all sorts of shadows and patterns that can play tricks on our perceptions. It's also worth noting that photo retouching in the pre-digital age was a common practice to improve clarity, remove dust, or correct imperfections, without necessarily implying a cover-up of extraterrestrial evidence. Yet the intrigue doesn't end there. Donna Hare's claims were publicly testified during the Disclosure Project's 2001 event in Washington, D.C. The Disclosure Project, spearheaded by Dr. Stephen Greer, aimed to compile testimonies from individuals with purported knowledge of UFOs, extraterrestrial life, and government cover-ups. Hare's testimony was just one among over a hundred, but her direct association with NASA certainly made her claims some of the most electrifying while Donna Hare's revelations have not been unequivocally verified, they do underline a broader cultural and philosophical debate. The very idea that there might be more out there than what meets the eye challenges our understanding of our place in the universe. It brings forth questions of what governments and institutions might know and whether they believe the public is ready for such knowledge. In the realm of space mysteries and conspiracy theories, Donna Hare's narrative is just one tantalizing puzzle piece. For believers, her claims might offer a hint of a much larger and concealed picture. For skeptics, they serve as a reminder of the human tendency to see patterns, to seek the extraordinary, and to sometimes mistrust institutional narratives. But whether one believes in her account or not, 
there's no denying its allure. We're talking about the possibility of structures on the moon, machines, buildings, the potential artifacts of an alien civilization or perhaps even ancient human endeavors. The very thought sends shivers down the spine. It challenges our knowledge, our history, and our very beliefs about life beyond Earth. Whether fact or fiction, Hare's story keeps us looking up, wondering, and questioning, which, if you ask me, is a fantastic thing for humanity. After all, space is the final frontier, and its mysteries are endlessly beguiling.